One of the biggest differences between Game of Thrones, the HBO show, and A Song of Ice and Fire, the book series by George R. R. Martin, is the presence of a leader of the others. Despite his disappointing death by a knife-wielding trampoline assassin girl, the Night King was, for a while, a terrifying force, leading the White Walkers and the Army of the Living Dead down from the north to snuff out all life in Westeros. For me, he was at his most terrifying when he was able to perceive Bran inside of Bran's weirwood net vision and leave that ice mark on his arm. Anything that can haunt you in the dream realm is a different level of scary. Hello, Freddy Krueger. Again, Night King went out like a chump. I mean, after showing himself impervious to raw dragon fire, he was then shattered by a small piece of rock. But the simple fact of his presence on the show highlights the glaring absence of any sort of equivalent character in the books. There is, of course, an ancient tale of a Knight's King in Westerosi legend, which we'll definitely discuss today, but he was supposedly a man who lived and died long ago, and no one has seen any sign of him since. Our author, George R. R. Martin, adds that Knight's King is no more likely to be alive than, say, Land the Clever or Bran the Builder, although those are weasel words if you ask me. So yes, the book version of the White Walkers of the Woods appear to have no leader. But I'm here today to tell you that that was not always the case. Not only was there once a king and queen of the Others, I believe that the first knights king and queen were in fact the creators of the Others. Later in this video series, I'll tell you who I think the original knights king was, and who might emerge as a new knights king, as a new leader of the Others. So strap in and let's dive back into the symbolism of the Others to find their origins. Hey there friends, it's Lucifer Means Lightbringer, and if you'd like to help me keep growing my channel, please click the like button and share this video on social media. And I noticed some 40% of you watching these videos aren't subscribed to the channel, so please hit that red subscribe button and the notification bell. I'm a hard-working dragon over here. If you want to support the program directly, you can check out our Patreon campaign at lucifermeanslightbringer.com, or you can make a one-time donation by going to paypal.me slash mythicalastronomy. All right, now let me tell you all about the once and future Night's King. All right, now at the end of Symbolism of the Others, the Kingsguard, which you've hopefully watched, I left you with a cliffhanger. After spending 20 minutes convincing you beyond the white shadow of a doubt that the White Knights of the Kingsguard are serving as symbolic proxies for the Others, dressed in all the same descriptive icy language, I posed the question, why did George do this, and then ended the video. You all seem to have liked that. I got a ton of great comments and theories on what George is saying. Many of you zeroed in on the fact that the Kingsguard were created to guard the king, which implies the others should have a king, just like they do on the show. Or maybe even a queen, or both. I do think the others did have both a king and a queen in the past, and will have one or both again soon. Of course, we have to start with the original, the OG Knight's King and Queen. Bran hears the legend of Knight's King from Old Nan, of course, and he relays it to the reader in A Storm of Swords while they're staying at the Nightfort, where Knight's King lived. It's a slightly longer quote, but it's one of the best, so I've brought in a talented pinch voice actor. The gathering gloom put Bran in mind of another of Old Nan's stories, the tale of Knight's King. He had been the 13th man to lead the Knight's Watch, she said a warrior who knew no fear. And that was the fault in him, she would add, for all men must know fear. A woman was his downfall, a woman glimpsed from atop the wall, with skin as white as the moon, and eyes like blue stars. Fearing nothing, he chased her, and caught her, and loved her, though her skin was cold as ice. And when he gave his seed to her, he gave his soul as well. He brought her back to the night fort, and proclaimed her a queen and himself her king. And with strange sorceries he bound his sworn brothers to his will. For thirteen years they had ruled, Knight's king and his corpse queen, till finally the Stark of Winterfell and Joramon of the Wildlings had joined to free the Watch from bondage. After his fall, when it was found he had been sacrificing to the others, all records of Knight's king had been destroyed, his very name forbidden. The first thing I want to point out here is that sacrificing to the others almost certainly means making others, or more specifically, giving up your male children to be transformed into others. Up north beyond the wall, we meet a nasty old wildling named Craster. Who's this little girl? You're prettier than half my daughters. Who also sacrifices to the others, which John describes as giving his sons to the wood, meaning the white walkers of the wood. 
Gilly, afraid for her own son, tells John that he gives his boys to the gods, going on to elaborate that she means the cold gods, the ones in the night, the white shadows. Then, after Gilly asks Sam, Sam the Slayer, to help her escape with her son, saying, if you don't take him, they will, Sam asks who they are. The boy's brothers, said the old woman on the left. Crasta's sons. The white cold's rising out there, Crow. I could feel it in my bones. These poor old bones don't lie. As you can see, it's pretty clear that sacrificing to the others means giving your sons to be transformed into others. We may not know what that transformation process entails, but we can see that Craster's wives all think of the White Walkers as Craster's sons, as brothers to Gilly's son and to one another. We can see a nice parallel to the Kingsguard here, as the Kingsguard are a brotherhood of celibate knights, and so are the others, since they're all male, many of them being literal brothers. And the fact they require male babies from their worshippers implies that they cannot reproduce on their own. That, that's the others I'm talking about, not, not the Kingsguard. They don't need babies to... Oh, anyway. Therefore, when we read about knights, king, and queen sacrificing to the others, we can assume they were creating sons to be turned into others. Except that there's one key difference from what knights, king, and queen were doing and what Craster was doing with Gilly and his other, quote, wives. Night King's corpse queen was not a mortal woman like Gilly and the other women at Craster's keep, but instead a magical woman. She had skin as white as the moon that was as cold as ice. And most tellingly, she has the signature eyes like blue stars, which signifies her as being animated by the cold ice magic of the others. A child born of such a woman might already come out of the womb with an icy nature, perhaps already having begun the transformation into another. Honestly, a mortal human baby could never gestate in a womb that is as cold as ice. So I think we have to assume the babies were magical entities themselves, animated by ice magic, just like mommy. The corpse queen description is probably not literal, as it's hard to imagine an undead being in this universe giving birth. But as my esteemed colleague Duran Durandon points out in his legendary essay from five or more years ago, One God, Two God, Red God, Blue Gods, and you can find the link in the description, we have seen a magical woman, who has far outlived her mortal span, taking someone's seed and soul to birth magical shadow entities. It's just that everything was coded in the language of fire instead of ice, and the shadows were the wrong color. As I was saying, it is an established fact in this universe that magical women can take the seed of a mortal man and give birth to magical shadow entities. You are the mother of darkness. I saw that under storm's end when you gave birth before my eyes. Is the brave Sir Onion so frightened of a passing shadow? Take heart then. Shadows only live when given birth by light, and the king's fires burn so low I dare not draw off any more to make another sun. It might well kill him. Melisandre moved closer. With another man, though, a man whose flames still burn hot and high, if you truly wish to serve your king's cause, come to my chambers one night. I could give you pleasure such as you have never known, and with your life fire, I could make a horror. Davos retreated from her. I want no part of you, my lady, or your god. May the Seven protect me. Melisandre and Davos are, of course, referring to the shadow baby, if you will, that Mel birthed beneath Storm's End, a shadow which Davos immediately recognized as Stannis. We know that Stannis experiences the killing of Renly while dreaming, which was also done by one of Melisandre's shadow babies, so we know that he remains linked to his shadow son, which is made of his essence, his life fires, as Mel puts it. So what we have here is more or less a perfect temperature inverted parallel. Night's Queen, a being animated by ice magic, takes the seed and soul of Night's King and creates magical white shadow beings, while Melisandre, animated by fire magic, draws from the life fires of Stannis to make magical black shadow beings. One shadow's made with ice magic and it appears white, and the other's made with fire magic and appears black, but these shadows do appear to be somewhat similar in nature, as they are both created to kill, and they're both susceptible to magical wards. Melisandre says that she has to give birth to the shadow baby inside the walls of Storm's End because... This Storm's End is an old place. There are spells woven into the stones, dark walls that no shadow can pass, ancient, forgotten, yet still in place. Similarly, Samwell tells Bran what Coldhands told him about the wall. It's more than just ice and stone, and that there are spells woven into it, old ones and strong, that prevent Coldhands from passing. 
Presumably these spells are the ones which keep the others out, and so we're left with Mel's shadows and the white shadows of the north, both being kept out by magical wards, and therefore similar types of entities on some level. The primary difference, besides color and ice versus fire, is that the shadow babies Mel and Stannis make do not stick around like the others do. However, it's pretty easy to imagine that there might be some further sorcery involved in getting such a shadow child to have a semi-permanent body as the others do. Maybe some sort of shadow binding, or further human sacrifice, or the involvement of weirwood magic, which also seems to be a part of the process of creating the others. And yes, I'll definitely have a symbolism of the others the Weirwoods video coming out soon to talk about that. Sacrificing to the others, then, is essentially a euphemism. What Night's King and Queen created at the Night Fort was a white shadow factory. They were creating their own Kingsguard of snowy white knights in ice armor, their own white swords. So that's pretty cool, right? George is showing us a big secret about the creation of the Others by using Mel and Stannis' Shadow Baby creation as a symbolic proxy, just like the Kingsguard serve as symbolic proxies for the Others. George is showing us that a magical woman can, under the right circumstances, co-opt the normal human birthing process to create magical shadow entities. And all we have to do is flip fire for ice, and we have a pretty viable method for creating the Others. We in the fandom playfully call Mel and Stannis' shadow child a shadow baby, but it's actually a full-grown shadow clone of Stannis. So it stands to reason that Night's Queen was actually giving birth to full-grown others, not babies. So much for White Walker Daycare. One thinks of the five others in the A Game of Thrones prologue who emerged from the woods to support the one that Waymar was fighting. They were named as Twins to the First. The White Walkers are shadow clones as well, in other words. And just as Mel's shadows are clones of King Stannis, Night's Queen's white shadows would have been clones of Night's King, from whose seed and soul she drew off of to make them. All of this makes it likely that this is indeed the origin of the White Walkers, that Night's King and Queen made the first others. Craster and Gilly can't make White Walkers directly because Gilly isn't animated by blue star eye magic and her womb isn't cold as ice. But Night's King and Queen would have been able to do so. They wouldn't have needed White Walkers to have already existed to make more. And what's the point of showing us this if not to show us the origin of the first others? It's important to understand that Melisandre is more than a magical woman. She's actually a human being who has traded in her mortality to become fully powered by R'hllor, TM. That means she no longer needs to eat to survive and barely needs to sleep, saying instead that R'hllor provided her with all the nourishment her body needed. Although that was something, quote, best concealed from mortal men, I guess because that would like freak everyone out if they knew she eats fire for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I guess. Anyway, Davos and Jon both notice that Mel's skin is hot to the touch and that warmth pours off of her as if she was some sort of human furnace. And that's pretty comparable to Night's Queen having skin as cold as ice. And just as Night Queen's eyes like blue stars are a tip off that she is powered by ice magic, Melisandre has eyes like Two red stars shining in the dark. Heck, George R.R. R. Martin even had a blue and green version of a Melisandre figurine commissioned, which looks a lot like Night's Queen to me. The point here is that if a mortal woman can somehow, via magic, transform herself into a fire entity capable of birthing magical shadow beings, then the same is probably true of ice magic. And indeed, my friend Duran Durandon suggests that that's exactly what Night's Queen was, some sort of ice priestess. This is another clue that Night's Queen was the origin of the Others, because we can see the order of the process that's being implied. First, a human woman transforms themselves over time via ice or fire magic, and then at some point they become capable of birthing magical shadow clones via that ice or fire magic. Between Craster and his White Walker sons, and Stannis and Melisandre's shadow children, we've been handed nearly every step of the process to make a White Walker, and thus Night's King and Queen are revealed as the father and mother of the Others. And now it's time for Timeline Heresy! Alright, so if Night's King and Queen made the first White Walkers, well, then that means they must have ruled during the Long Night, when all the White Walkers attacked, right? Not shortly after, as implied by the line about Night's King being the 13th man to lead the Watch. But here's the thing, there are just so many ways around that line. I mean, it's about as solid as Ned Stark's paper shield in the throne room of the Red Keep. 
start with the fact that we're talking about five to 10,000 year old history that wasn't written down until thousands of years after the fact, none of the details of which should be definitively taken as literal or factual. For example, the number 13 may be symbolic. After all, Knight's King was also said to have ruled for 13 years. And I suppose maybe it's just a coincidence that he was the 13th Lord Commander who ruled for 13 years. But then we have the last hero story, which occurs in roughly the same time and place and involves one guy with 12 companions for yet another 13. Some have speculated that the last hero and his dozen companions actually could have become Knight's King and the first others. Or it could be that Knight's King and Queen made 12 others for their Kingsguard, if you will. For what it's worth, the HBO show did give us 12 White Walkers flanking the Night King when they took Craster's son to the White Walker Temple for transformation. Of course, neither George Martin nor HBO would be the first to make some sort of weird version of Christ and the Twelve Disciples. And thus, when I see all these thirteens in the Knight's King and the Last Hero story, they strike me as a number chosen for symbolism more than anything else. Consider also the part of the Knight's King myth where Old Nan says that Knight's King was only a man by light of day, but the Knight was his to rule. Is he some sort of werewolf or something? Did he transform into a powerful wizard at night only? Seems like you just go fight him in the day then, right? More likely, the night that he ruled was the long night, it seems to me. Night's king ruled the long night. Think about it. It's not that crazy, really. For what it's worth, 13 years does seem like about the right length of time for the long night to me. Here's a good question. Why would there be White Walkers lurking close to the Night Fort to give babies to if the White Walkers had just recently been defeated in the War for the Dawn? If they're back prowling around again only a hundred years after they were defeated, well, I'd think we'd be hearing about White Walker attacks all through Westerosi history. But instead, we hear nothing about any White Walker activity in between the Long Night and their recent stirrings gearing up for the new Long Night that is surely coming. Then we have the fact that the Children of the Forest supposedly gave gifts of dragonglass knives to the Night's Watch during the Age of Heroes. But the Age of Heroes supposedly comes before the Long Night, when the Watch was supposedly established. Similarly, Bran the Builder supposedly built the Wall, but is thought of as having lived in the Age of Heroes too before the Long Night. Of course, this type of mixed-up chronology is just what we should expect from 8,000-year-old word-of-mouth history about magical events. And this is quite intentional on the part of the author. We also have to wonder about the part of the original Night's Watch oath that talks about I am the watcher on the walls, note the walls plural, because ever since the creation of the wall, the great ice wall, they would have been the watchers on the wall, singular. Now this may mean nothing, or it may indicate that the Night's Watch was originally formed from a previous fighting force which guarded walls plural, like the walls of a fortress perhaps even before the wall was made. If there was such a previous fighting force, perhaps they had 12 commanders, with the Night's King being the rebellious 13th. Then we have the Night Fort, the spooky Night Fort, the place where Knights King and Queen created their white shadows. The Night Fort is said to be the oldest castle on the wall, which I think is definitely true, but I think it may actually be older than the wall and older than the Long Night for two reasons. One, if any humans were involved in the building of the wall, which is a big if, granted, they would have needed some sort of base of operations to work from. Perhaps it was some long-vanished ring fort or something, but if the night fort dates back thousands of years to the beginning of the watch anyway, well, it may well have been that first human stronghold in the area. The second and more important reason that I think the Night Fort may be very, very old, older than the Wall and the Night's Watch and the Long Night, is because of the highly unique weirwood organism that we find there. Some 50 feet or more underground, Sam and Bran and company encounter the Black Gate, the peculiar talking weirwood face which guards a secret tunnel beneath the Wall and only opens for a Night's Watchman reciting his vows. But then up on the surface above, we see a young weirwood sapling pushing up through the flagstones and growing towards a hole in the ceiling. Now, judging by the size, extent, and depth of the weirwood roots at Blood Raven's Cave, it seems that weirwood trees are really better thought of as a fungus-like organism which exists primarily underground and then occasionally sprouts trees above ground. Thus, it's almost certain that the talking weirwood gate below the night fort and the young weirwood above are part of the same weirwood organism, which would make it extremely large and therefore very old and very sacred to the children of the forest and those who worship the old gods. Moreover, the talking weirwood face itself is possibly the weirdest and most unique magical thing we've seen anywhere in Westeros. I mean, it's the only talking weirwood of any kind that we've ever seen. Chekhov's silent tree face finally speaks, right? Therefore, it seems likely that the Night Fort would have been built around this very special and unique weirwood organism, which would have been here first, just as Winterfell was built around the Heart Tree and probably the Crypts.
At the center of the grove, an ancient weirwood brooded over a small pool where the waters were black and cool. The heart tree, Ned called it. The weirwood's bark was white as bone, its leaves dark red, like a thousand blood-stained hands. A face had been carved in the trunk of the great tree, its features long and melancholy, the deep-cut eyes red with dried sap and strangely watchful. They were old, those eyes, older than Winterfell itself. They had seen Brandon the Builder set the first stone if the tales were true. They had watched the castle's granite walls rise around them. It's my belief that most, if not all, the First Men castles were built around weirwoods, not just Winterfell, as by the time these castles were built, the First Men would have been worshipping them, fully in awe of the power of the Green Seers and the weirwood trees. This is clearly the case for the family of wargs known as the Starks, and with something as old and unique as the talking weirwood face at the Nightfort, it seems logical that the Nightfort would have been built around the weirwood, just like Winterfell. The same logic applies to the location of the wall. If the weirwood organism is older than the wall, then it's likely that the location of the wall, at least in that area, was dictated by the location of the Nightfort weirwood thing. So the order of events I'm picturing is this. The Night Fort is built around the weirwood organism there for some magical reason, either by Night's King or by someone who came before. Then at some point around the beginning of the Long Night, Night's King takes the Night Fort as his seat and creates the White Walkers with Night's Queen, again with the weirwood magic likely playing a role too. Then they lead the others in an invasion of Westeros. The War for the Dawn is eventually fought and won by the good guys. The wall was likely built soon after to keep the others out, like most people think. Or perhaps it was repaired or rebuilt if some form of the wall existed before the White Walker invasion. So what we have here is a whole bunch of fog of history, because our history has essentially become legend. The symbolism, however, all points towards Night's King and Queen being the creators of the others who lived during the Long Night, as you've just seen. The White Walker symbolism of the Kingsguard implies that the King and Queen of the White Walkers is an important thing, and it implies that the others were created by Knights King and Queen to guard Knights King and Queen, just as the Kingsguard was created by Visenya and Aegon to guard the royal family. Then Stannis, Melisandre, Craster, and Craster's wives show us how these implications translate into actual magical acts that can happen in this universe. They show us how an ice priestess like Knights Queen could potentially create the others from scratch. As I'll explain in the next couple of videos, Night's King is just as much an important Song of Ice and Fire archetype as Azor Ahai is, with multiple figures playing the symbolic role of Night's King at various times. And here's the thing, Night's King is always implied as a leader and father of the others. King Stannis, for example, who does the shadow creation routine with Melisandre that mirrors other creation, takes up residence at the Night Fort, where Night's King lived. I have tons more on Night's King Stannis coming in the next video, don't you fear. Night's King was a man who knew no fear, and neither should you. The same thing is true of Night's Queen. It's an archetype played by multiple people, and those people always do symbolic things that represent the creation of the others. One of the reasons why my Moons of Ice and Fire podcast series, from which a lot of this material is drawn, is so many hours long is because we follow all of the Night's King and Queen parallel characters, and there are a nice handful of them. I'm doing a much more condensed thing here, but check out the Moons of Ice and Fire series if you like the topic and want to see how, say, Val, Gilly, Jane Poole, Alice Karstark, Sansa, or Lyanna play the Night's Queen role. Lyanna is the important one. She gives birth to the prince that was promised to the others, Jon Snow, who dreams of wearing ice armor and, oh gosh, I'm giving away a future video in the series. Even more important than the symbolism, I know, I know, heresy, heresy, is the valley of the shadow of narrative sense through which all theories must pass. If the role of Night's King really is to be some sort of King of the White Walkers, then it makes far more narrative sense for him to have existed during the Long Night, when the White Walkers invaded Westeros for the one and only time in history. And if we are to see a new Night's King rise to lead the others, and believe me, is there ever a lot of foreshadowing for that, then it stands to reason that a Night's King led their invasion of Westeros the first time around. Alright, so if the others are shadow clones of Night's King, fashioned from his seed and soul by Night's Queen, that begs the question, who was Night's King? Was there anything special about him? Was he a green seer or a dragon lord? Some sort of ice wizard like Night's Queen? Was he a Stark or a squisher or what? We'll answer this question and more in our next video, but please comment below with your theories on who Night's King was or anything else in this video. And make sure you click that cute little notification bell next to the subscribe button, which you've already pressed by now. Thanks to all of our patrons, including some brand new myth friends, and I'll see you next time.